Is it true that businesses are only as healthy as the people who run them? Uh, we're used to counting rows of stock on the shelves or counting customers that come in through the door or log on uh, or appearing at the bottom line of a balance sheet. But there is another factor that we may well be ignoring and to, that's to our detriment as managers and of course to the detriment of our businesses. It's something that's been screaming at us for quite a while now and we've been ignoring it. How are our staff coping personally? Psychologists Emmy Golding and Peter Diaz have been looking at uh, the field of workplace mental health for some time. And they've written a book which is a guide to managers about how to deal with this elephant in the room, or the office, or the factory, or the studio, or any workplace anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. So how important is mental health to the health of the business? Well, I think mental health is a tsunami that's coming. It's on its way. If it's not hitting workplaces already, it will be shortly. We're seeing the impacts that it's having around the world uh, in workplaces. The impact is going to be huge for workplaces. And uh, the, the, the situation right now is that most workplaces are not ready for that. How much emphasis has been given to workplace health in the past? Well, I think where, when it comes to psychological safety in the workplace, we're 10 years behind our physical health and safety. Mm. You know, I was uh, the other day looking at those photos where you used to have construction workers up on tall buildings with no safety harnesses and they're walking along that beam. And now you think, uh, how, how did we ever do that? Well, I think that's kind of where we're at with psychological safety at the moment. So why have we ignored this for so long? I think it's, it's, it's been seen as an expense, something that doesn't make money. So it, 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 it's, it's, in most cases, it hasn't even been a budget item until now. So what, what's happening then is that people are reacting to a problem instead of being proactive and avoiding a problem. So hopefully we can turn that around. We're trying to help to encourage people, businesses and managers, don't leave it until it becomes a problem. You know, deal with the situation, create a culture that is people friendly and business friendly because both have to go hand in hand. You can't just give so much attention to people that the business suffers, but you can't give so much attention to making money that people suffer. They, they go hand in hand. Yeah, so, okay, first things first, what are the signs that a business has got people in it who are suffering? You know, sometimes the, the, this is an interesting one because uh, mental health problems, we know from the data that 50% of people will not tell their managers they have a mental health problem regardless of how severe it is. So that, that you could be having a mental health problem in your team right now, and according to statistics, you do. <laughs> if you've got more than 10 people, you have at least a couple of people in there that may be having a mental health problem to, you know, to, depending on the severity of the, of the problem, it doesn't have to be completely severe, but you could be having two at least. and. Um, but you may not know about it, or they may not be willing to talk about it. So the, the issue is big. It's, it can be under the surface, but what we're seeing now, especially in Australia, more people are coming out because we've become more aware. More people are putting their hand up and saying, yes, I do have a mental health problem. In some cases, they wait until there's a performance uh, management meeting, and then they've, they've gotten into trouble to say, well, the reason why I'm not performing is because I'm anxious or I'm, or I'm depressed. And then the HR teams are panicking and say, well, what do we do now? Because we went in with this objective of dealing with a conduct or a performance issue, but now we found that there is a, a mental health issue. What do we do? And that's when they come to us, they come to the Workplace Mental Health Institute. And that's why we wrote the book Mental Wealth, uh, you know, to, to help managers have a, a good balance between helping people and caring for people and making sure they're engaged and also taking care of the business. So mental wealth is not really a mental health book. It's a business, it's a leadership book that deals with the mental health aspect of things. Let's tease some of that out. Stress and pressure are a part of any workplace environment and obviously they're, they're a, a factor causing uh, mental ill health. But looking at stress and pressure in the workplace, what's the difference between normal stress and abnormal stress? And that's, I'm so glad you raised that because we can't get rid of 
all pressure, all challenge in the workplace. You know, we're there to perform, to create, to get things done. And so a workplace that tries to eliminate anything that may potentially uh, create some sort of pressure for people, it's just a futile exercise. What we instead want to do is build up people so that they are able to take on more and more challenge. So they're able to, to have those, those psychological strategies and there's a whole range of different uh, approaches that people can use, but have those strategies to be able to meet and exceed the demands. And that's a great question because people are being paid these days in, in the modern workplace, more, more often than not, we're being paid for our ability to carry certain pressure and produce under pressure. That's what we get paid. Exactly. I mean, otherwise it would be a gift. It wouldn't be a salary. You know? So we get paid so we can deliver on goods. So that, in, that out of the gate, it means that we're expected to feel certain pressure Whereas we turn it into stress or not, it's completely up to us. There's a difference between pressure and stress. Pressure, if I like pressure, it's exciting. If I think it's going to hurt me, it becomes stress and it's damaging. So, for example, I mean, um, if, if um, a person goes to the gym, um, everybody knows that in order to grow your muscles and be fit, you have to lift weights and it's going to hurt. It possibly is going to hurt tomorrow too, if it's going to be any good. We know that. So, but what do most people do? They go to the gym, it hurts, and they feel good about it. They, f they don't feel stressed. They feel, this is doing me good. Pain equals good. In the workplace, it's the same thing. If pain equals good, we have excitement, we have engagement, we have a great workforce. If pain equals, oh my God, this is hurting me, now we have stress, we have okay. problems. That, that what you say is, 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 of course, true, and we know that, but there are different sorts of pain. Uh, mm. Let's look at the work environment. More than ever, it's a place of great change, and therein lies one of the ironies of the modern workplace. Technology and information are increasing exponentially yes. uh, at the rate of knots, yet it seems to be accompanied by a shrinking in the workplace. And there are fewer staff, tighter budgets, greater emphasis on the bottom line, and to misquote Churchill, we never before have so few staff been expected to produce so much with so much less to work with. That's a reality. And it's almost like there is an inevitability that staff are going to suffer on a personal level because of that. And we have to be careful of that. That is a reality. In some workplaces, we have seen that. Um, they are doing more with less people, and that is a problem. So when that is happening, we have to be very careful. We have to be very honest as managers. And also as staff members, if, if we're being given too much work, we need to be able to go to the manager and say, look, I can cope and give you a good job, um, produce uh, to, the, uh, to the excellence that you require by handling this, this, and this, and this. But if you want me to do this, then I'm going to have to cut back on, on the, how I'm performing. There's, you know, a human being can only perform so much. So that conversation needs to be had. And also the manager needs to be humble and needs to say, am I overwhelming my staff? Now, I think if you don't, as a manager, if you, if you don't ask yourself that question, and, uh, or if you, proceed after, if, you, if you proceed after answering in the positive, yes, I'm overwhelming my staff, but I don't care, I'm just going to do it, um, that's not going to pay off. That's, that's going to cost you in the bottom line. It may be a hidden cost, but it is going to cost you. Now we know how to work those things out and there's a, there's a financial cost to that. So this comes back to your question about signs. How can you tell when a workplace, there's people struggling? And I think for most organizations, it's once they start to see the productivity decreasing because people, when they become overwhelmed, when they become so stressed, they're so busy that nothing gets done. And you know, I think we've all been in that space at some point where we feel overwhelmed and we just don't know where to start. So you, you see more and more of that. And there's, the research has shown that productivity can be reduced by up to 50%. So you're paying someone for a full-time job and you're only getting a half-time job done. Uh, the other thing you then start to see is absenteeism. So people not showing up. So these are the sort of things that you can track and measure. But a, good manager who is in touch with their people and understands their people and has the skills, not just the awareness about well-being, but the skills to actually go in there and 
keep an eye on their people and know what are the signs to watch out for and know what each of their team is capable of and how to work best with them, they're going to be able to prevent a lot of that happening. So that's good both for the employees and it's good for the business. What you say about managers being accountable to their staff is, is really interesting. Uh, and of course, it's, it's true, but they're also accountable to their managers. And very often the pressure that they're placing on the staff underneath them is actually directly coming from the manager above that mid-level yes. manager. And, and that's an issue of culture. And we deal with, with the aspect of culture in the book Mental Wealth. Um, that's why we call it an essential guide, because it, it actually, it, if you put in place the principles that are in the book, what you're actually doing is you change the culture of the organization. And um, we do know from cultural studies, how do you change the culture of the organization? You need two points of pressure, frontline and CEO. <laughs> if those two points of pressure can, can come closer together, it changes the whole structure of the organization. I want to tell you a story. Well, actually, it's not a story. This, this happened to me. And what it did was it shed light on, on other situations. We're talking about workplaces that have been shrinking in resources and the ex expectation of reduced staff to meet a greater need. And that applies like across the board in every industry. Now, an industry that I'm not a part of, but I use, industry that you've no doubt used is public transport. Yeah. My uh, pregnant daughter had to travel from the top of the state down to... Uh, where we live in the city at short notice she was fleeing a situation she had all her worldly goods in two enormous bags right? enormous each one of them like was the weight of a person <laughs> and she had a toddler in tow she was on her own and she was on the train heaven knows how she got on the train but she texted me and she said and, and I'd, I'd intended to meet her at the station of course she texted me and she said dad can you please get onto the platform and help me off the train I thought, yeah, of course, of course, no problem. So I get there and to cut a short story, a long story short, I couldn't get onto the platform. There was no staff at the barrier. There was no way I could get through the barrier. There was a person who was managing the station locked up in a booth that I could see in the distance and they were protected from the, the general public. Um, I even thought of buying a, an Opal card, couldn't get an Opal card, mine was in the car. All I could do was top up the Opal card, couldn't do it, there was no way of doing it. Uh, so what did I do? I had to jump the barrier. I had to break the law. All the time I was scared I was going to be on video camera. And I, I knew someone <laughs> yeah. was going to apprehend me, but I had this problem of my daughter arriving on the station. She had like, how, how long do you have to get off the train? It's like that, yep. Not long. I thought that I was stressed, she was stressed, the toddler was stressed, but also the, the station manager would have been stressed too if he, if he knew about that. Yeah. Of course he would have been. This is one of the uh, unexpected costs of what the economy and our managers are doing to our staff. And it's, it's not something you're always aware of, mm. and it's always something out of left field that highlights what's going on. But yeah. there is a sense of helplessness in the face of all of that. That also contributes to workplace mental health. Absolutely. And that, that um, meeting of technology and people, we haven't got it right yet. And what we're seeing uh, around the world in our travels is that uh, some, some organizations are going back to having people answer their phones, not a machine. Is that right? Yes, yes. they are. You know, that, that's becoming people their, the their unique country? selling propos uh, proposition. Yes, exactly. <laughs> in the same country, yeah. people answering the phone and saying, you know, how can I help you? Not pressing the buttons until you get someone or having a machine answering you. Now, the, of course, there are advantages to technologies. We have, uh, we have created a very interesting, a very wonderful world in some sense because of technology. It's very comfortable. But when it comes to the workplace, sometimes we have removed that ability of the human being to say, yes, you're breaking the rules here, but the rules were meant to be broken in this occasion in, for the sake of humanity. And I think we've all felt the impact of that, where we feel, uh, hang on, am I, am I important or not? I don't feel important. I don't feel like my life matters or my problem matters because I'm being dismissed. And I think that's happening in workplaces where um, caseloads are becoming too big. 
people are feeling dismissed. Managers are feeling dismissed. They're, they're talking to their managers, presenting the, the point of view of the people, and they feel dismissed. And that's what we talk about in, in the book, Mental Wealth. We, we talk about real compassion. Compassion is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Compassion has to have a long-term view of things, not just fix the problem right here, right now, so we can go down to the next problem, but what do I need to do right here, right now, so in the long term, I have a good relationship with my people, they have my trust, and I manage upwards, so I have their trust and I have influence. So that's why I say that Mental Wealth is a leadership book, because it teaches people how to become influencers of the world and also connectors. Mm. Okay, now the cost of mental ill health in the workplace. First of all, what are the obvious ones? Uh, presenteeism, which is where people are showing up at work, but they're not all there. They're not able to perform. The lights are on, but no one's home. They might be uh, sitting on Facebook all day. Sorry, Facebook. <laughs> uh, so they're present, but they're not really producing. Absenteeism. The other one that it's sometimes difficult to put a measure on, but conflict, HR issues, the team dynamics and, and the time and the energy and the effort that gets spent on dealing with all of those issues. When, I mean, when people are stressed, we all respond differently, but one of the common ones is we get irritated. We, we might say something that we wouldn't normally say to someone. Um, so, so all of those things come together and create a downward spiral, unfortunately. And that's what we want to do is change it around. And it's, it's complex, but there are simple things that managers can do as well. And that's what we yeah, share. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. In terms of, of, of the, the impact on workplaces, we know from the research also that stressed out people are more likely to uh, complain of harassment and bullying. Mm. So um, we talked to, a, talked to a director of HR once and, and she said, up to 70% of the problems that we have in HR, I think, have got a mental health issue behind them. 70%. Mm. Let's talk that, about that. That's HR. an expense. <laughs> Let's talk about All HR. Right. Uh, look, the name of the department has almost become an oxymoron. Yes. Uh, many industries, especially the bigger ones, have got two levels of staff. They've got the entrenched and the transient. Mm. And over time, HR has become more or less permanently a part of management. Uh, dealing with staff coming and going. And a direct result of that is that it ends up looking after the interests, not of the staff, but of the company. In other words, looking at how they can minimise the effect of losing somebody or minimising the effect of that uh, disruption. How can we control this? How can we manage this? How can we control our staff? You know? And the things that go wrong from day to day. Not what we can do to support the staff mm. and to look into the cause of the problem in many situations. Should we close down HR completely and start again? Absolutely not. No way. We love HR. <laughs> we cannot do with the learnings of HR. HR has been around now for a couple of decades at and least. And there's a move it? to change you yes. know, people and culture is what so many departments are now moving towards to try yeah. and highlight that we do care about people and the culture and that these two things, the business results and the well-being of staff, are not mutually exclusive. In order to support the business results and all the things that are you know, the bottom line, you, you need to look after the people. The people are the biggest asset to the business. That's where, for most industries, most of the investment is made. So if you're going to invest in people, do it properly and get the results out of your investment. And, you know, HR has been caught between the sword and, and you know, what, what's the, the, the saying? A rock and a hard a place. A and a hard place. <laughs> I was thinking of the Spanish saying. The, and between a rock and a hard place, um, they've been brought in by management <laughs> to yes. do a job. So they're being paid by management to take care of people. So, and I know a lot of people have had very bad experiences with HR, unfortunately, sadly. I do think, though, that one of the problems that HR has had traditionally is that they haven't had a lot of power. They've been brought out to make things nice, 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 and, and quieten things down, but no real say or voice when it came to the executive level. What generic mm. situations have you seen where HR has lost, fumbled the ball? Oh, uh, when making, you know, for example, in, in, in the area of mental health, you know, most of the, most of the people that are our biggest supporters in, in the industry are HR. 
and they know the importance of this. They come to the trainings. They go and say, oh, my God, I wish everybody got trained. And they go back and they talk to their managers. And because they don't have enough power in the organization, now, that's not true in all organizations. In some organizations, they've become really powerful and they're doing really good work. But, you know, the majority of, of workplaces, they don't have the power that they should. Um, they, their suggestions are taken on board only um, as, as a general suggestion, if we have the money, if we have the budget, we will do it. So, so it goes nowhere. Um, and that's just the problem that HR has had. And, and of course, because they've had the job to fire people, people don't like them. <laughs> but, you know, um, that's one of the side effects of that. The HR managers that we speak to, the HR directors, they, are, they normally can see the whole picture. Of course, and they're, they the, say, they're the ones who are motivated to want absolutely, to do better, Absolutely, because they the can see if the frontline leaders, if the frontline team leaders and supervisors and managers had just, a, just a, a couple of skills under their belt to be able to handle issues early, to be able to lead their teams well, then that would prevent a whole lot of the issues escalating and landing on their desk and having that impact on the business later. Mm. So what sort of thing. issues have you seen that have escalated? Uh, look, it's, it's incredible sometimes the things that seem so mundane. Um, someone said something that I didn't like. Yeah. And, and then it snowballs. If, if a manager's not equipped with the skills to be able to handle those sorts of situations well, then it snowballs and it becomes now I'm stressed and I need three days off or three weeks off. Or, I mean, some of the organizations that we work with have been paying staff for months, even years, and the staff haven't been at work for months or years. They're on paid leave because we just don't know what to do and this person's um, had a, a conflict in the workplace, for example, that, or they've had a situation and they just, they don't know what to do. Managers are really um, in a difficult position because they want to do right by the person, they want to do right by the business. There's no clear cut guidelines as to, well, I know I've got to look after people, but what do I do? And so that's where the book comes in. <laughs> the, the, one of the interesting one that I remember from years ago, a staff member came into a workplace and um, she decided that the way the, the the workplace was arranged person didn't feel comfortable to her and then she brought hr on board to you know to change the physical distribution of the desks and everything and in order to keep her happy they had to change everything around we're not always the most reasonable people and we're not the nicest people simply because we're not management and i think that's one important thing to we we, we all need to be humble and we, we all have the capacity to be a bit of a diva from time to time. And when we're in that space, we're not nice. You know, whether we're in HR management or frontline, you know, and this is what mental health is about. Mental we're health human. is about, look, we're human. We all, can, uh, we all can spit the dummy from time to time. How are we gonna handle each other when one of us does spit the dummy? And it's gonna happen. <laughs> you know? And I think that's, that works better than if we expect people to never do something wrong. Sure. Of course, HR has done something wrong. Is everybody in yeah. HR beautiful people? The majority are, but not all of them. Psychopaths are everywhere. <laughs> but that is also true of frontline staff, you know? Psychopaths are in there too. You know, we, too, we know that about three to 4% of the population have got psychopathic traits. Um, so, the, but, but generally speaking, HR, the people that, from our experience, are beautiful people, they don't have enough of a voice. And, they, and I'm hoping that in the future, they get more of a voice because they have a good understanding of what makes people tick. There's another elephant in the room and you raise it in your book. Another one. Um, suicide in the workplace. Yes. There was a scene in a very famous movie called Network by Sidney Lumet and had the, um, the, act, the Australian actor Peter Finch. And he said very famously, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And that became a, uh, a catch cry. And it was a huge speech in depth and length and emotional commitment. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, his ability as an actor was, boy, it was on show. He did it in one take. They started to do a second take, but they had to abandon it because he had heart problems. Oh, he was getting too worked up. He, and he had very serious heart problems. And there he was at work over overextending his his physical abilities. Mm. So thankfully they stopped shooting. 
he ended up getting an Academy Award for that one take, but he got it posthumously. You could go on and talk about the, the uh, astounding irony of that particular workplace situation. Mm. Or you could talk about Apocalypse Now, where Martin Sheen uh, legendarily, went, his character went mad at the end of the movie and he, and he got uh, accolades and awards for it. But during the shooting of that, they had to cart him off to hospital. Uh, of course, in Network, the character shoots himself live on camera, which was considered overstating things a little bit by all the critics at the time, and it was considered a black comedy until years later that very thing actually happened. And Sidney Lumet and Paddy Chayefsky famously said at the time, this is not satire, this is real life. In your book, you have this amazing figure saying that somebody takes their own life every 40 seconds around the world. That's an astounding statistic. And whether it's 40 seconds or 40 minutes or once every 40 days, you can't close the door after the horse has bolted. It's a classic case of too little too soon. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what sort of research has been done about suicide in the workplace? The research on suicide in the workplace continues. A Victorian study found that about 17% of the suicides in that state, 17% were due to problems in workplace. So that, that's still very high. I mean, 40, for, uh, a suicide every 40 seconds around the world is huge. Um, yet, 80, 75% to 80% of those are men. So we have a huge problem with suicide and male suicide. Um, and, you know, one suicide is too many regardless of gender. But what can we do in the workplace? Obviously, people are not happy. You know, that is something that we get from people. They're not satisfied in the workplace. And one of the reasons why they're not satisfied is because they, they're not connecting with the purpose of their workplace and the, workplace, uh, the, the purpose of their lives. And a person without purpose, it's like a ship without a rudder. It's, it's aimless. It's not going anywhere. And to be aimless for a human being is not a good thing. Workplace is actually good for your mental health. You know, that's the irony. It, when, we, when we put a person with a mental health issue in, a, in, a work, in, a, in, in work that is, is significant and it contributes back to the community, we see a better recovery overall. So it's good for your mental health. And yet, if, if you don't manage to connect to the values and the vision of the workplace um, on, in your team, then you remain disengaged. And that's when the danger starts, because suicide doesn't happen in community. It happens in isolation. Suicide is decided in your head, not in a collective. And some people that suicide take a collective with them, but the decision is individual. So we can do a lot in workplaces to turn that around as managers. Is, that's why I say Mental Wealth, the book, is a leadership book because it teaches managers how to lead their teams so they're connected with, with something meaningful. One of the things that, that I see in, in talking with so many organizations is that sometimes there can be the attitude like if people have personal problems, they should leave that at home. Um, and if, if someone takes their life, well, it wasn't our, it wasn't our fault and it wasn't our responsibility. And, and, and that's right. Ultimately, you know, people take actions themselves. Having said that, there's still an impact on the business. So when we go around and we and deliver training internationally, one of the questions we'll often ask is, you know, just for a show of hands, how many people know someone who has taken their life? And you'll normally get 75, 80% of the room say, yes, I know someone. And yet it's something we don't talk about every day. So all of, not just the person who's taken their life, but all of their colleagues is, are gonna be impacted as well. So it's quite common for us to hear from organizations who perhaps have delayed you know, doing anything in the space of mental health. And then they contact us and say, oh, we, we wish we'd come to you sooner because now we've had to shut down operations for days, weeks, months sometimes because everybody's reacting to this incident that's happened, yeah. you know, and, and we don't know, we're out of our depth. We, we don't know really how to handle this, you know. It's, we like to keep our boxes of work is here and home is separate, but in reality, people aren't They're like that. They do, other. they impact exactly. on each other. Yeah. So we've got to look at the whole person, the whole 
employee. And it's not just frontline, it can be very high level people as well. That yeah, and talking about an employee, yeah. just to every single individual, how much responsibility do they have to take, do we have to take as people for our own workplace mental health? A hundred percent. I believe that um, no one cares about your life as much as you do, period. Now, are there caring people around us that we can act we can we can connect with and they can help us absolutely they're there do they care a hundred percent about your life they do but they can only care as much as you let them so that's an important thing i see a lot of emphasis on stopping suicide i think that's the wrong focus what we need to focus is how do we connect with people how do we make people happy so happy they don't want to die people just want to die because they're not happy suicide is a symptom it's not a problem it's a, it's a very fatal symptom. But you know, the problem is people are not happy. Connected people, happy people don't want to kill themselves. So that's why we're going to go back. We've got to go back to the basics. And this is why I like workplaces. Workplaces, sure, they're artificial. We come together in an artificial way, but it, they're highly social workplaces. We can, we, in, in some workplaces, I've seen them operate almost like a family. They can't wait to go to work. I've seen most workplaces, that doesn't happen. But you know, in some teams, they love each other. They, they're, they're there for each other. They've got each other's back. And how do you create that? And that's, yet, that's, that, that's also the, always changing as well, yeah. because there will be that group dynamic will shift and people will come and people will leave. And, and then that can... And it's up to the manager to sustain that, to know how to talk to people, to know when to talk to people, to know what to say, to what not to say, uh, what to do, because sometimes people won't talk, but they'll do. Okay, so how much can a, a workplace uh, actually support a team member who's suffering mental health? How far can they go? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's one that a lot of the managers have as well. And it's, it's really important that they know the limits of their capability as well. We're not upskilling people to be counsellors or psychologists or therapists or anything like that. Even though some of them might like to go that far, we can see that can be counterproductive as well. So it's uh, really important they know where that line is. And that's things like identifying it in the first place. As a human being, one person to another, having a conversation and showing care, showing compassion, as you spoke about earlier, uh, showing empathy, uh, sharing information about, you know, what are some of the options? Because it's not just a one size fits all solution when it comes to mental health. You know. Everyone's situation is so completely different. You know, what works for one person may not work for someone else. So managers need to be really careful that they're not giving advice um, or, you know, what worked for me, um, but that they're opening up a conversation and, and allowing the person to go and get the support they need from wherever they need it. That they're, and they're, they're on the side as a, a go-to person if, if there's anything here in the workplace that, that may, I may be able to assist with can't promise the world, I can't do everything, but I'm here and we'll talk about it and let's keep that line of communication open. And it's amazing what people are able to do when we feel supported. Mm. You know, just to know someone's got our back, that sometimes that's all that is needed, you know, for it's that little bit extra energy. And that's, that's what we're talking about sometimes, you know, that, that energy to climb out of a hole. And sometimes, guess what, once they find out that somebody has got their back, they find out there was no hole to begin with. They just had this idea in their head. Um, that's why we find with conflict. When people get to talk to each other, they realize, oh, oh, so you didn't mean that. Oh, right, okay, so I've wasted two days of my life <laughs> making this huge problem in my head that has disappeared by a two-minute conversation. So we teach people how to have that conversation in, in the book as well. Now, early in your careers, yeah. You've worn many hats. Yes. yes. You have separately been in workplaces. How have you felt your mental health has been? <laughs> Personally, perhaps, Peter, first to you. Have you been in a situation in, a, in another life where you've been in a workplace and you knew that you were suffering mm. and perhaps yeah. you didn't know how to handle it at the time? I, yes, and, and I was in that situation because I, I'm in, in, during the 90s I did have bipolar disorder. Uh, diagnosed and I, I and I took medication for it and suicide was one of those options that I contemplated and um, until I reached a point one day they said that's it no more and I took a hundred percent responsibility I didn't know how I was going to do it 
but I started crawling out of that hole. What was the, f the first step? To taking that responsibility, that, as you said, that's it. To realize, to realize that it, no matter how loving and beautiful people are around me, no one is going to care about my life or should care about my life more than I do. I, I need to take care of my life. I need to find out my answer. I, I, I'm a unique individual, and what might work for you is not exactly what works for me. But what did work for yeah. you? What for, for support me, did you my, get that worked? What I did was to go and, and research what had people that felt great about life did that I didn't do. <laughs> That's what worked for me. So, um, uh, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela, he seems to have it together. He was 27 years in prison. If I'd been 27 years in prison, I don't think I would have lasted too. You know, what did he do? How did he approach the world? What was his way of thinking? So I read a biography on Nelson Mandela. I, 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 I tried to soak up his personality, his way of, of acting, of understanding the world. Uh, Gandhi was another one, you know, uh, going from trying to fit in with society to becoming a disruptor and, and through peace, through peaceful means, through peaceful means, get rid of a, of an empire in in India. That's, that's a that's a huge achievement. So how did he approach people? And and, and it was incredibly similar. The Mandelas of the world and the Gandhis of the world and the Bransons of the world or Mother Teresas of the world. They have a way of operating in which they do not act as a victim ever. And that was the that was the lesson for me. And, and to, to realize that there was a pity party going on in my brain. <laughs> you two work closely you know. together. Yeah. Have you ever challenged Peter and said, stop feeling sorry for yourself? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we, we keep each other accountable to that yes. all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. It has um, to happen. It, absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's helpful to have someone like, like that of around course. you, you know, whether it's uh, someone in the workplace, whether it's someone at home, at, you know, a friend, a family member. Yeah, we have fun with that. Years ago, <laughs> did you discover for yourself the effects of um, mental ill health in a workplace? Uh, look, I don't think I've ever, I mean, we talk about where's that line where it crosses over into a mental health problem, something that's been diagnosable or not. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that crossed that line, but definitely, you know, our levels of mental well-being fluctuate. And there are definitely periods at work for one reason or another where I, I can remember, you know, having been more stressed and usually it comes down to the dynamics of in, in, in amongst people, socially. You, you had a HR boss, <laughs> HR yeah, boss, yeah, had... that was not very HR-ish. Yes, yeah, and, and well, I've had a number of different HR because that tends to be the, the area of a workplace where I gravitate to. And so I've worked with HR a lot and I've had, you know, exactly what I was praised for in one, from one manager was what was a problem with another manager. Um, and you know, the good thing is, I think because we adopt that philosophy of taking responsibility and taking that personal responsibility and not going into the victim space, that kind of allowed me to say, well, what are my options here? How am I going to deal with this? Can I, can I manage up? Is there any, what can I change in this dynamic? How do I want to approach it? Or when is the time for me to move on to a new challenge and, and take on something new because this situation simply isn't working for me? Um, and they're, they can be very difficult decisions for people to make. Um, you know, do I stay? Do I go? How do I, should I change me? Should I try and change them? How do I tease all of that out? Um, but for me, that making a decision and moving forward was what was most important, not to stay stuck in. in a okay, system. great. Yeah. Now, um, maybe we'll just go through a checklist of things that managers can do. Just brief responses to basic questions like if someone came to you and said, what should I put in place? What's the first thing you'd say? Smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how many managers wreck their culture by not smiling. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to do one thing, just make sure that you smile. When you're talking to someone, make sure that you smile. You know, I have that problem, but I, I, when I get into my head, I get very serious and then people get intimidated. And when I learned that lesson, now I force myself to <laughs> just smile, you know. And if I'm sending an email, send an emoji, a smiley, you know, at the end, so they know that you're okay. 
Because that's the, the question people are asking, are we okay? That's what your staff are wondering. Am, am I in trouble? Are, are we okay? Um, and it's ridiculous because we're grown-ups and we, and we hate it. We don't want to think like that, but we do. And we need to acknowledge that. What should be taken out of the workplace? Oh, Facebook, yeah. <laughs> social <Yeah>. media. <laughs> yes, yeah. people do too much comparison. They, you know, when, when we go on Facebook, what do we put in you know, our holiday pictures and we see the people having this wonderful life and where are we? In the cubicle, <laughs> looking at our Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> that's, that's not very convenient. You can do the Facebook in later. Okay, what yeah. should be added to manager training? Skills-based training. Awareness isn't enough. We can't just be aware of this issue. We need to actually know how to deal with it. So uh, one of the, the things that I've seen those organisations do who are benchmarking is it becomes part of induction. Part of the induction program is that we care about psychological safety and workplace well-being and here's a basic skill set and it teaches people from the very beginning that this is the culture we support here so they get that attitude shift as well as the skills and the knowledge to be able to apply it and make a difference so for managers yeah mental health and well-being training that is skills based that is going to teach them how to be better leaders in this in this space for staff resilience training mm. they need to become a little bit tougher we've become a little bit soft um, and this idea that somehow, you know, life is, you know, a bed of roses. And, and it's not. It's not. We need to get back to reality and, and learn to cope. And I think those two would be a great addition to any workplace. Very often you get the opportunity to get your staff together, um, usually for reasons of discipline or direction. But what should be the first thing you say or what should be the main takeaway from it? any meeting with your staff? I'm fond of saying that you should meet with your staff to tell them good stuff more often, six times more often than you meet with them to tell them bad stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a, a, a workplace boss to, to, front, to, to, re, to person reporting to you. It's a little bit like a marriage. If you're always criticizing, it's not gonna last. But if for every criticism, this is based on research, yeah you say six positive things in between, you have a great marriage. <laughs> so the same thing in workplaces. Yeah. Make sure that you praise yeah. meaningfully, not like, hey, you're a top bloke. That's not praise. That just makes people, um, you know, comfortable and not productive. But tell them what they're doing well. I love the way you did that report. I love how you cross those T's or whatever it is, but give six times for every time that you got to tell them something like, hey, I noticed that you didn't say hello with a smile. Can you do that better next time? No problem. I got gotcha. you. Because I, I know you know I'm a top bloke. That's not a problem. But if I'm not sure of that, geez, am I doing anything right? So that's and what that I would do. And that ties in with what we often talk about is remember why you hired someone in the first place. Mm. You hired them because they had a skill set, because they had an attitude set. Remind yourself of that and then remind the person of that. You know, that's what you're here for. You're, you're contributing, you're offering value. You know, we all like to know that we're valuable, as in we contribute to this group. By the way, that sounds easy, yeah. but just ask any married person how easy it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, talking about mental health in the workplace, how can you put in, in place effective monitoring? Of mental health? <sighs> That's a, a double-edged sword because as soon as you start asking people to rate how well am I feeling today, for example, and I've seen some try to do it with good intentions, it forces the person to look inwards and look for problems. And so what happens is people go, oh, yeah, I, actually, I am a little bit stressed about that. And, it's, and they snowball. It, it builds and it becomes a focus of looking for problems as opposed to how do I just feel even better? How do I feel even more confident, more capable, more resilient, stronger, happier, more relaxed, more creative, all of those things. So what ways can you monitor it? I think less is more sometimes. You do want to take the pulse of the organisation and you can do a, a, we recommend sort of an annual basis, having some kind of survey that t covers on a number of different topics, but mental health wellbeing should be just one of them. 
and it needs to be worded very, very carefully so that you're not creating problems, that you're getting a sense of where things are at. So you can make sure your activities that you're implementing are making a difference as well. And how can yeah. you do it without being intrusive? Uh, well, the, the or do online, you have to intrude? We do have an online assessment for organisations yeah. that can be done that is worded in such a way where we get a, a true picture, not mm. making matters worse. Mm. Um, and that, how we avoid that being intrusive is, is by making it highly private. Yeah. So we get the results and we don't know who said what. It's just gone out completely to the whole anonymous. world. Completely anonymous. So it's completely anonymous. And that gives, that gives organizations a, a true picture of where things are at. Yeah. 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 Uh, I want to talk about rigid realities. Yeah. Interesting. You see, staff, in the face of the problems that we all face in the workplace, Staff can end up becoming malleable and flexible, but maybe in the wrong ways. You know, they start too early, they finish too late, they take on too much, they do stuff that's out of their area because it needs doing. How can we encourage staff not to be malleable in the wrong ways? I think it's about, again, recognising diversity in terms of our work preferences yeah. and our personality styles as well. So we talk about this amongst us, you know. Um, I tend to be an on or off person, whereas Peter's 24 seven, the brain's yeah. going thinking. Uh, so for some people, uh, if they're enjoying what they do, then long hours is, is not a problem, you know, because they, that's what they throw themselves into. For other people, work where it is just a small part of their life. And so it has its place amongst other things that are important to them in their life as well. So I think respecting that diversity that everybody's different and again, knowing your people, figuring out what works for you. How do you monitor yourself and know when, all right, I've probably bitten off a bit more than I can chew here. What am I gonna do? How do I pull it back? Who do I need to speak to? Do I just chew faster for now and mental note, don't do that next time, learn to say no. Um, again, it's not one size fits all. Yeah. Okay, what can we do, what should we do if we become aware of a team member who is suffering? Talk to them, yeah. Yeah, raise it with them. Ask, ask that question, are we okay? Not are you okay, but are we okay? Is, is, you you want to find out if, if, and you can tell them, have I done something that has upset you or, or have I done something annoyingly, obviously, um, that has, you know, caused some problems for you. And in most cases, you will find out that a person will come back, no, 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 it's fine, it's got nothing to do with you. And it's, it's like a weight has lifted off them because they know that you're onto something. It's, and you can continue, you can say, look, the reason why I ask is because you normally are really chatty in meetings and, and you know, the last week I haven't heard you, you've been in the corner, very quiet, and we, I feel that we're missing out on your wisdom that you contribute to the team. So. So be very specific as to what you have seen or what you have heard directly from them. And, and what if it's not, I'm sorry, what, what if it's not a broken relationship, but it's just an observation yeah. of yes. somebody's situation? How, yeah. Do you approach it with them? What if they're not receiving that? Yeah, um, look, they may not want to talk about it. Yeah. And so do you go fine. to your manager? Do you, uh, I always think it's best to respect that person's privacy. You know, if they don't yeah. want to talk about it, that's fine and they have every right to keep it to themselves. But more often than not, people will share a little bit of something. But even if they don't, just the fact that you've raised it, that you've asked, that you've shown that you notice them, that you care, that in itself can make a huge difference for the person. That could be the thing that spurs them to say, all right, I'm gonna go and get some external help with this. or it's enough to know that there are people around me who do care and I don't want to tell them all the nitty gritty details of what's going on for me, but at least I know they're there. Mm -hmm. This could be also a good time to tell them, look and remind them what you find special about them. Because if a person is suffering, I, I can guarantee 100% of the time there's a very bad self-talk happening. And somebody coming along and say, you know what, we appreciate you the way that you bring, the warmth that you bring into the team or whatever it is and the expertise on this and that, be very specific on it, um, can be very healing for that person. It can, it can interrupt their, their pattern, their process in a very positive way. Mm. Mm. So at the end of the day, how do we encourage people to 
actually deal with the things that they can't change. Look, I think sometimes we become too rigid on the things that we can't change. Um, what about doing something else? <laughs> you know, if you can't travel a certain road because, and you used to travel down that road, but now there's work, what do you do? Do you just sit in the car and cry? Because you, no, you just <laughs> turn around and Gotta find, find some other way. way, you know, put a GPS on. And, and we do see that happen in a lot of workplaces. We see people that shouldn't be in that work. Is the wrong job, <laughs> period. It's got nothing to do with the manager. It's got nothing to do with the organization. They're simply in the wrong job and they won't get out because nobody's helped them see that. You know, uh, I, I've seen artists that should be accountants and accountants that should be artists and they won't be happy until that happens. So yes, it's important as individuals in, in this environment of change that we learn to change quickly too. So how better are we getting at adapting to the conditions in the workplace? I think we've got a little way to go. As I'm, human beings struggle with change. It's, it's built in as part of our survival mechanism um, that anything different could threaten my survival. So if everything just stays the same, I'll be okay. Um, so, but the world is changing, as you said earlier, the it, technology, the globalization, the way everything's changing, we do need to get better at changing with it for our for our own well-being and that may mean as peter said leaving and getting something new but it may be changing the way we approach it and changing how we think about it and changing our perspective on things as well thank you thank you thank you ian